Charles Spurgeon, a Baptist preacher in the latter half of the 1800s, said this phrase several times in his sermon. What would Jesus do? This phrase had a resurgence a hundred years later. It became a whole Christian movement in the 90s. I can remember myself wanting a W. W. J. D. Bracelet. All right, I see I got some help in here on today. But I had no idea what the bracelet or the letters really meant. I recently found out they were to encourage us to imitate Christ. To imitate Christ means that we live like him. We talk like him. We act like him. And we think like him. We are called to imitate Christ in our doing and in our thinking. Thinking and doing go together like peanut butter and jelly, like chicken and dumplings, like Pastor Atchison and Alexander McQueen shoes, like macaroni and cheese, like bacon and eggs, like salt and pepper. If we're going to act better, we first must learn to think better. The truth is a lot of Christians are saying that they are too blessed to be stressed while they are living mentally bankrupt. There are so many of us that are blood washed, Holy Ghost filled saints and we're dressed up well while we're mentally hanging on by threads. But there is a word today because God does care about your mental health too. Turn with me, will you, to Philippians 4, verse 8 and 9. Will you stand for the reading of God's word? In these two verses, we are going to find a blueprint for how Christians should train our thoughts to imitate Christ. I will be reading from two different versions, the NIV and the Easy Bible version, but whatever version you have, it's all right. Beginning in the NIV, verse 8, you'll find these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. The easy version says it like this in verse 8. Now, my friends, I want to say this to you. Fill your minds with thoughts about good things. Think about things that are true, clean, right, and lovely. Always think about the things that people know that are very good. Remember what I have taught you. Remember the message that you heard from me. Remember what you saw when I lived among you. You must also do those same things. God is the one who gives peace in our minds. He will be with you. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You may be seated. Just for a few moments, I want to talk from the thought, your mind matters. If all of our thoughts were to be put on this screen this morning, uh uh-oh, what would it reveal about you? That's probably a scary thought because our thought life is a very private and intimate matter. Most of us would like to keep them secret, even from God. Paul is wrapping up his four-page letter, so Aaliyah wasn't the first one to write one, amen? And he is writing to the Philippians, but Paul is writing from, not from a penthouse in the Maldives. Paul is actually writing from prison. And he's giving this last bit of advice to the Philippians, and it applies to us today as well. And he gives it in a list form. And I would like to propose to you, maybe he gave it in a list because he knows his people. We love lists. Lists are purposeful and they're useful. List helps us prioritize what's important and keep things in order and help us remember information. They let us know what we need to accomplish. Now, y'all don't look at me strange. Y'all know y'all got lists. 
grocery list, bucket list. And for these babies who just went back to school, school supply list, chore list. And y'all know Christmas is coming. Christmas list, a list of ingredients, a list of people to call, a list of cheat codes, a list of passwords, a list of colleges you want to attend or restaurants you want to check out. And if you plan on being married, I'm told people even have a list for what they want in a spouse. People love lists. I bet at least eight people today got a list on their phone. In Philippians 4, 8, Paul gives us a list of godly attributes that if you're going to make your mind matter, we should follow. Research shows that every second of every minute of the day, we have thoughts traveling through our mind at a rate of 268 miles per hour. Neuroscientists say that on average, we have 70 thousand thoughts in one day 70 so that means at the end of each week you would have had almost half a million thoughts by the end of this year alone you would have had over 25 million thoughts I think that's a good enough reason to examine what you're thinking especially since 90% of what we're thinking you already thought, you just thinking it again, and then you thinking it again because you didn't know that you just thought about it, and then you keep thinking it, yeah, like that. Maybe that's why the Lord tells us to renew our minds daily. So I want to suggest to you that if you're going to make your mind matter, you first need to examine your thoughts daily. In school, you learn that a verb was an action word. And so to examine is a verb. And to examine means to inspect or to investigate the condition of something or someone. To examine means to look within, to scrutinize, to question. So as people, we only have one or two mindsets. Either you have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Well, what's the difference? If you have a growth mindset, you focus on what God can do. If you have a fixed mindset, you focus on what you can do. Which mindset do you have? Paul tells us in verse 8 to fill your minds with thoughts about good things. To fill your mind is not a one time thing. It's a continuous action, meaning that you need a refill throughout the day. So you just can't get up, read your devotion, or read your three scriptures and pray and go throughout the day. Because probably by 10 o'clock, you're going to need a refill. Amen? Amen. Then probably by 12 o'clock, you're going to need a refill. And on some of y'all jobs, you might need a refill at 10 or 1. Amen? But whatever you do, you need to know that you need a refill each day. And that means you have to take into account what you're thinking about. What are you filling your mind with? So what are thoughts? Thoughts are those words that run through your mind that tell you about the things that are going on around you. Our thoughts have power, which means our words have power. Annually, my doctor often gives me a physical examination, which includes blood work and x-rays. She does this so she can better understand what I got going on in my body so she can help me. Most people don't mind getting physical examinations, but when it comes to a mental examination, Come on now. that's a different story. Yeah. Some of us would rather undergo hours and hours of surgery than talk to a therapist one hour a week. So your thoughts help you to act better. So maybe that's why David was a man after God's own heart. Because in Psalms 139 and 23, David says it like this, search me, God. Look deep inside me. See what is there in my thoughts. Show me if I'm following any evil way and lead me in the way that's right. So ask yourself, what is my mind filled with? 
Because whatever your mind is filled with, your mouth will be full of. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 15 and 8. The words that people speak come from what they think. Like I said, whatever your mind is filled with, your mouth would be full of. And so you have to examine what you are thinking about. How do you do that? Watching what you say. Someone suggested to me that you should take a recorder around in 24 hours and record your conversations. Anybody up for that? (laughs) But if you want to find out what your thoughts look like because our thoughts are invisible, just take a recorder around with you and just record yourself all day when you are talking to people and are not talking to people. The enemy knows that your mind matters. The enemy will always first wage war in your mind. He already knows because that's the place your battle is either won or it's lost. The enemy is not necessarily trying to kill you physically, but rather mentally. He wants you to meditate on the lies. He wants to kill your witness and prostitute your peace and destroy your dreams and steal your joy. This battle we're fighting is not a carnal one, but rather a spiritual one. And if we're going to be victorious, we must use the spiritual weapons that God has given us. You cannot have spiritual victories using carnal vices. So every time life happens, you can't keep breaking down. You can't keep self-medicating and complaining and gossiping and ruminating and giving up. If you are a soldier in God's army, you got to break out and not break down. So when life starts happening, you need to know, let me go ahead and tell you, you a no-limit soldier. And guess what no-limit soldiers do? No-limit soldiers don't break down. They break out the oil and they anoint their head for battle. No-limit soldiers don't break down. They break out in prayer. No-limit soldiers do not break down. They break out in praise and worship. No-limit soldiers don't break down. They break out the word about their situation. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So if you want to live a victorious life, the first thing you must do is to examine your thoughts daily. During the pandemic, like most of us, I was quarantined at home, and I decided to do something risky, scary, and dangerous all at the same time. And those that know me, I am a risk taker. Like I've jumped in a hundred feet, a hundred feet sinkhole and I can't swim. (laughs) I've even held a shark before. But this thing that I did during quarantine messed me up. I began to examine my thoughts. And let me tell y'all, what I found out is all 70,000 of them wasn't on God or the things of God. I would tell y'all what that was about, but we in church today, amen? But let me just tell y'all, I owe me and maybe a couple of other people an apology for what I was thinking about when I saw my thoughts on that mental examination table. So I realized that if I want to change my speaking, I must change my thinking. So while I was calling on Jesus, I also picked up the phone and called my therapist and made an appointment. So if you're going to change your life, you must first examine what your mind is filled with so you can identify what needs extracting. Extraction is my next movement, and extraction is also a verb. Extraction means to pull out forcefully. And if anybody in here is like me, if you've had a toothache before, you want to extract your whole mouth and sit it on a shelf somewhere, but instead... I went to the dentist, and the dentist extracted my tooth to relieve my pain. And so if you can go to a dentist to get help for your mouth, who do you go to for your mind? If you're going to make your mind matter, you need to know it's some things, some people, and some things you need to extract. Unfortunately, your negative thoughts are not just going to go nowhere because you want them to. 
They don't just move out the way because you say, move, get out the way. Rather, <laughs> the thoughts that we need extracting have been there for years. They have an I shall not be moved kind of attitude. They have a knock if you buck kind of spirit. So if you're going to extract some thoughts, you got to be willing to fight back. Some thoughts you got to snatch out. You got to get ugly with that thing. You can't just sit up there and be all cute. You got to have an ugly face with it when you're snatching some thoughts out. And Jesus gave us snatching power. Jesus gave us extracting power. As a matter of fact, how do I know that? Because Paul says in Ephesians, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead it lives in you and me so stop rehearsing the childhood pain stop reenacting the traumas stop rehearsing the hurtful memories it's time to extract it's time to extract the suicidal thoughts it's time to extract I can't do this and I'm unlovable and I'm not good enough and I I'm worthless and I am a failure and it's time to extract you got to fix everybody problems God oftentimes have to extract what is hurting us in order to heal us if you're if you're often in pain keep walking because it's in your pain that you often will find your purpose no one is born with negative thinking no one if you think negative, you were, thought, you were taught to think that way. So anything that we learned, we can unlearn. Look with me in verse 8. Paul says, think on these things. To think on means to direct one's mind toward, to meditate on, to roll over, to marinate on, to dwell on, to ponder. We need to ask God to fill our minds on the mind of Christ or whatever Paul said in Philippians 8. I think he said whatever things are true. That means whatever is honest. Knowing that God is good no matter what. Whatever is noble, that means that's worthy and deserving of respect. That means giving your parents honor. Whatever is just and right and fair, that means things that are due to other people, like giving God and people what you owe them. We live in a society that people don't even say thank you. When I was growing up, I was taught when you wake up in the morning, you're supposed to say, thank you, Jesus, for waking me up this morning. Anytime people do something for you and they ain't got to do it, you want to thank you. Whatever things are pure, things that are uncontaminated and unblemished. Think on those things. Think on things like a newborn baby. Think on things like the blood of Jesus. Think on things that are lovely. People who are pleasant to be around. Are you lovely? Think on things that are admirable, things that are of a good report, things that you look up to, speaking well of others things that are excellent of the highest quality like when you go to brunch today complimenting your waitress on a job well done thinking about those things that are praiseworthy that's worth celebrating like celebrating the successes of other people even if you're not in your winning season Paul gives us this list but he also accompanies it with another list I guess Paul like lists too the next list I want to give you is found in Galatians 5. This is also a list that we would do well on having, and it's a list of spiritual fruit. If you want to have the mind of Christ and you want to stop eating bad fruit, then these are some good fruit you can chew on daily. Love, chew on it. Joy, chew on it. Peace. Chew on it. Patience. Chew on it. Kindness. Chew on it. Goodness. Chew on it. Faithfulness. Chew on it. Gentleness. Chew on it. And self-control. 
chew on it and chew on it again. If your mind and your mouth is filled with this list, you might not say some other words that's not in this list. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Allow the Holy Spirit to help change your mind by changing your mouth. And if you would do well, if you put this list on a sticky note, put it on your mirror, put it on an index card, but most of all, hide it in your heart. Paul is not suggesting that we practice toxic positivity. He's not suggesting that we only focus on the good things that's happening and ignore the negative things that's happening. Rather, he is telling us not to get caught up in our emotions and not to be controlled by our external circumstances. So if you want something new, you got to remove something old. When I go to see my nail tech, she first removes my old polish and then she puts on the new. If you're going to repaint an old car, you first must remove the old paint and then put on the new paint. And if you like me and you like to change your hair color every other week, you first must remove the old color and then put on the new color. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to our mind. If you want a new way of thinking, you have to first remove the old way of thinking. The Bible says it like this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, things are new. Extraction of thoughts means that you're choosing to let it go and move forward. You cannot let it go and move on at the same time. Paul tells us like this in Philippians 3 and 13. I don't think about those things that's past because they are behind me. But instead I focus on what is in front of me. I know like most that traumatic experiences can impact You're thinking, but it's time for us to rise above the reason we can't get well. There's a familiar story found in John chapter 5, and Jesus encounters this man at a pool. This man had been there for 30, well, he at least been lame for 38 years, and I found it interesting that Jesus didn't ask this man, how did this happen? He didn't ask this man, what did your mama do to help? He didn't ask this man, did your daddy show up at any other doctor's appointments? Jesus asked this man a personal question. Do you want to get well? Because healing will always be between you and Jesus, no matter who caused the wound. This man gives Jesus all the reasons he couldn't get well. Won't nobody help me. Somebody always beat me there first. Jesus looks at this man and say, get up. Take up your bed and walk. Like many of us today, we keep offering Jesus our excuses. We keep telling him what mama did and what daddy didn't do for us. All the while he is standing there ready and willing to heal us. But we first must be willing to let go of our codependent pain and our past. Jesus commanded this man to take charge of the very thing that had him bound. So it's time for you to let go of your mama trauma. It's time for you to let go of your daddy drama. It's time for you to get up. And there's some women that's listening to me today that you are bound by your brokenness. You have formed a codependent relationship with your brokenness. And your brokenness has now turned into bitterness. The words that you used to speak were so sweet and now they've turned sour. Well, I just stopped by to tell you, the potter wants to put you back together again. I read somewhere in the Bible that Jesus has a master's degree in broken things. So even though the wound may not be your fault, healing is your responsibility. You can't keep allowing your past to keep you from your promise. Jesus gave us his spirit to help us transcend our traumas. Ephesians 4, 23 and 24 says it like this. Let God's spirit make you think a new way. Take up a new nature that God has prepared for you. 
on October 17, 2021, yeah. I was watching a Dallas Cowboys versus New England Patriots game. I was quite frustrated with Trayvon Diggs because he had not been as defensively involved in that game as he'd been in previous games. Just as I was voicing my commentary, he gets a pick six. <laughs> in my excitement, I hop up. It's only true Cowboy fans would do only to lose my balance. Uh-huh. I fell and hit the back of my head on a windowsill. I lost consciousness for a few seconds. I later on found out in the emergency room that I had incurred a mild concussion. But then I realized something. I had to bump my head so God could fix my thoughts. So if you're going to make your mind matter, you not only need to examine your thoughts daily and extract negative thoughts, but you also need to elevate your thoughts in the truth. And that's found in the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book. Y'all didn't go to vacation Bible school? <laughs> Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if we're going to elevate, that's also a verb. And by now you know that means to convey, convey action. So to elevate means to rise up, to lift up to promote, to go upward. A lot of us like to be elevated on our jobs. We don't want to be elevated in Christ. A lot of us like to be elevated in our relationships. We don't want to be elevated in our thinking. But after God, the most powerful thing is your mind. Your mind is a gift from God. So tell me, how are you using your gift? How are you putting your gift into practice I don't know about y'all, don't judge me, but sometimes I regift gifts. <laughs> I got any regifters in here? <laughs> but I want to offer to you our mind is never to be regifted, it's meant to be renewed. So if you look in verse 8, if you, I'm sorry, if you look in verse 9, we're wrapping up, and Paul says this that we're to focus on the things that we have learned, received, heard, and seen him do. He says, put this into practice. The reason why some of us don't have peace is we're not practicing. The reason why some of us don't have peace is because we're not practicing. Well, what are we supposed to be practicing, Alice? What you learn by reading the Bible? You're supposed to put into practice what you've read and received in Sunday school, what you've heard through the preach word, what you've seen God do in your life. God is calling us to think higher. God is calling us to think higher because our minds matter. It's time to elevate your thinking. It's time to get on the elevator and go up. It's time to go up in your thinking. How do you go up in your thinking when you got to first watch what you're watching? How do you go up in your thinking? You need to watch the people that you're hanging around. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes hanging around the wrong people. Sometimes the reason why you can't think better is because you're hanging around people that don't think better. If you ever see an eagle with a chicken, it's going to look out of place. The reason it's going to look out of place, as a matter of fact, a chicken's brain is two ounces. An eagle brain weighs between six and 15 pounds. What am I trying to tell you? Some people, if you keep hanging around, if they can only hold ounces, they're not going to push you to handle pounds. It's time for you to start getting your weight up. It's time for you to be ready to handle pounds. You've been on that milk a long time. It's time for you to start chewing some food. So if you want to elevate your thinking, you first must start thinking through God's lenses and not the words, not the world, the wounds, or your weary. So how do you elevate your thinking through paradigm shifts? What is a paradigm shift? A paradigm shift is an important change from the usual way of thinking to a new and updated version of thinking. The first thing you must do in this paradigm shift is take every thought captive. Make it sit down somewhere and obey Christ. 
Paul says it like this, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I understood like a child, but now that I'm a man, I don't act or think like a child anymore. The reason why some people cannot get the proper updates is because your mental storage is too full. It's too full of the past. It's too full of shoulda, coulda, wouldas. It's too full of, well, I would have, but I couldn't. It's too full of the pain, too full of the brokenness. It's too full of all this other stuff that don't matter. But if cell phones need updating to work properly, how much more does your mind need updating daily? Jesus has given us the power to unplug every lie that's in our minds. The number one trick that the enemy uses is lies. There's a song, my mind's playing tricks on me. Y'all come back, come back. I felt a dun 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 dun. This was a rap song by Brad Jordan, better known as Scarface. Scarface got this inspiration for this song from his grandmother. Scarface said he overheard his grandmother talking one day. And he said, Grandmother, what did you say? She said, oh, nothing, baby. My mind's just playing tricks on me. So the next time the devil tells you you're not going to make it, that your situation is not going to get any better, that you're not going to pass algebra class, I want you to tell yourself, my mind is just playing tricks on me. The next time the devil tells you you're not going to have the money for college tuition or you not going to have the money to buy that home, I want you to tell yourself, my mind is just playing tricks on me. When the devil tells you you cannot outlive your past, I want you to tell yourself, oh, my mind is just playing tricks on me. When the devil tells you you cannot change your way of thinking, I want you to tell yourself, oh, my mind is playing tricks on me. When the devil tells you that God has forgotten about you and he don't know your name, I want you to tell yourself, my mind is playing tricks on me. Every time you recognize a lie, every time you recognize your mind is playing tricks on you, you're elevating and shifting your thinking. Every time you speak the word, you're elevating and shifting your thinking. So let's practice. The Bible says, God is for me and not against me. The Bible says that greater is he that's in me than he that's within the world. The Bible says he'll turn my mourning into dancing and my sorrows into joy. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine hearts. Lean not to thine own understanding. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. The Bible says, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. The Bible says that God specializes in things that seem impossible. The Bible says, wait up on the Lord and you shall renew your strength. The Bible says that by his stripes, I am healed. The Bible says that I'm a, I'm a lender and not a borrower. The says I'm above and not beneath. The Bible says be still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Bible says that weeping may endure for a night but it's only one night though because joy is coming in the morning. The Bible says that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says I can do all things Christ that strengthens me. And if you let him rest, rule and abide in you, he'll create paradigm shifts that you could never imagine. Everything has to change when you call on that great name. I can see shifting happening right now. Shifting in your thinking. Shifting in your finances, shifting in your marriage, shifting on your job, shifting in your faith, shifting in your vision, shifting in your faith, shifting in your health. But there is another shift that happened one Friday on a hill forward. That's the old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It 
was at Calvary where Jesus was hanging between two thieves. It was at Calvary where they placed a crown of thorns on his head. It was at Calvary where he was pierced in his side. It was at Calvary where he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. It was at Calvary where he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was at Calvary where he said, it is finished. It was at Calvary where he hung his head. And for you and me, he died. It was at Calvary where the greatest paradigm shift of all paradigm shifts had appeared to have failed. They buried my Jesus in a borrowed tomb. But early Sunday morning, Jesus interrupted the regular schedule programming just to prove that there is no failure in God. So I just stopped by to tell you, if you're ready to elevate on today, the master shifter is in the house. Will you let him shift you? Because your mind is a terrible thing to waste.